All right, and good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to uh, this evening's OTF Connect session, presenting uh, Mary Kay Gwendy and Making Space for the Makerspace Movement in Your Classroom Commons. Uh, we've got people from all over the province here. I know Syria uh, is sorry she can't be here, and Mary Kay, she wanted to, to wish you all the best and say hi. She texted me a few minutes ago. Even when she's not here, she makes sure she's, she's known and she touches in on, on everybody. Very so, true. Yeah. So we've got a good mix of people from all across the province, right? And that's one of the awesome things about OTF Connect is we can bring people from everywhere, right? So even on, as, as we were saying before we, we went to, to the recording here, the day before the March break starts for everybody, we can still come together for, you know, an hour and a half and learn a little bit from each other and with each other. So it's a really, really cool, um, it's a really cool thing. And it's just, I've, I've been privileged to be part of it. And, and, and uh, thank you all for joining. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary Kay, who uh, I've known for quite a while, actually. I'm, I'm really keen to, to hear from her because I know she's got a wealth of, of experience in, in this stuff. And um, she's sort of a person who does what she talks about. She's not just a talker, she's a doer. So Mary Kay, I'm going to stop talking, turn it over to you, and you are in charge. Oh, boy. That struggles for everyone. Hey, everybody. Um, my, my little world here, uh, summarizing things that I've been thinking about uh, with respect to makerspaces. Um, it, as I said in the description of the session, I'm brand new at this, and maybe you've got more of the answers and I've got more of the questions, but it's definitely a conversation that I want to have um, a lot this year and, and going forward. So I would like to learn a little bit about you so that I could tailor this to your needs and maybe skip over some of the talking points that I have and spend more time on um, the ideas that might be most interesting to you. And just before I go there, I'd love it if you'd grab the microphone um, and interrupt, because it's not really interrupting, and uh, join the conversation um, whenever you feel you've got something to share. Because I can't follow the chat quite as quickly as uh, you might be able to. So first thing I'd like to know is, is um, because this is both in the classroom and in the learning commons, I, I was curious uh, where where you work day to day. Are you a classroom teacher? Are you a teacher librarian or other? So you could grab a text tool and tell me what you're teaching or just kind of put your check. Awesome. Cool. Who's the other and, and, oh, here it comes. Nice. I see a couple more people writing. Grade four and the library. I'm grade six in library, so I, I can understand that. Perfect. Somebody knows I love math, they threw up a calculator just to make me more comfortable. I normally present on math and this is making me nervous because I'm out of my comfort zone. But, but that's good for all of us, right? Okay, I don't think anybody else is trying to add. So, oh, maybe. And here's another piece, another little poll. Uh, I should have maybe just used the poll in the chat, but either or, grab the polling tool that Colin talked about earlier or make your mark on this whiteboard. Have you ever attended a maker fair or worked in a maker space before? And I guess maybe once you've made your mark, either in the polling tool or on the whiteboard, maybe you could type in chat or grab the mic and kind of um, what images come to your mind when you hear the term maker fair or maker space, just so that we're all sure we're on the same page and kind of imagining the same sort of experience or location or, or anything like that. I think tinkering might be my favorite education word right now. Nice. Oh, 
awesome. So I'm just going to turn the microphone over to you guys, and I'll just listen to you because all this is is perfect. I guess I'm going to ask a question too, if we can clear the poll and ask how many of you might grab the microphone tonight because I'll quit asking if if nobody's going to be interested. So is anybody going to talk? And then I'll just kind of keep watching the chat a little bit more, the type chat. Okay. As long as I got one person. Yeah, I'm going to jump in too. I'm going to really encourage you to, to jump on the mic just for a few yeah. seconds. It's, it's easier, it's quicker, and it's it's pretty safe. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to so echo Mary Kay yeah. that it's really much nicer to hear people's voices coming through. So so feel free or, or don't be shy, right? So really give it a shot. Try something new tonight, maybe take a chance, right? Just like making a makerspace. We're all taking chances with this stuff. Absolutely. So. Um, you all have the same vision of that I have when I hear the, the Maker Fair or Maker Space. And I would say until this year, I would have had to answer no uh, on this uh, for this question. I don't think I'd really ever done it. Just so you know a little bit about me, because I always hate to go to a workshop or, or go and listen to somebody speak, and then I don't know their background or what context from which they're making their comments. And, and sometimes that helps me. So bit about me, so you see how the lens through which I'm looking at um, this topic. I've been teaching for 24 years, and all of one of those, I've been a grade 7 or 8 teacher. Um, and everything was going along tickety-boo until last September. So about the third week in September, our school went under a reorganization. And my principal, so I had a grade 8 classroom, called me in on the, the Thursday and told me that on Monday I would be a new FDK teacher at the school with 15 um, kindergarten students, JKs and SKs, in my charge. And so Thursday night, I won't lie, I did cry and visit a store with four letters. Um, and it was an interesting Thursday night, but by Monday morning I kind of, um, you know, got my head around this and ended up having the most wonderful teaching year, professional year, I could have imagined. And then just because of the way the school worked out, I'm back now in a classroom, but the there was no intermediate classroom for me, so I'm now working as a the teacher librarian in our library learning commons, and I'm also teaching a grade six math class. So, so that's kind of where I'm coming from when I make comments. Um, Maybe they'll make more sense to you knowing knowing my background. So joining this uh, the Library Learning Commons this year, I knew there was a lot about um, maker spaces, and I was feeling a little bit um, unsure of where I was going to go with this. But always, when you just calm yourself down and think about it, I knew a lot about it um, already, and especially from my year last year. So. This is just a brief, it's a two minute video, but this is, um, when I joined the FDK program, I heard a lot about Reggio Emilia, Italy, and how they teach um, kindergarten students, and um, it intrigued me, and I joined a group in our board called the 100 Languages Group, and I started um, to explore the foundations in this Reggio Emilia program. And this is just a short clip that will summarize a lot of my thinking from my year last year. Thanks, Colin. He's going to bring it up here in the in the tour window. And probably the link is also going to appear in the chat after. So when it comes up here, you will have to press play. Uh, no, actually. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah, not? If it all works as the way it's supposed to, when I hit enter here, this should come up and oh, just start awesome. to play automatically. If that doesn't work, I will also put the chat in, or put it uh, put the link into the to the, the chat room where you can pop it open and play. Uh, for those of you on a mobile, I'm honestly not sure if this will work. You might have to click the link and it might throw you to YouTube and then you have to come back. So I don't know, but I'm going to hit enter for this one. That should start, and I'm also going to put it over here.
forgot to mention, when the video is finished, can you just give us a quick green check mark just to make sure everybody's finished up? Cool. And maybe while it's finishing for a few or while they're finding the green check, your reaction to that little clip, that poem? Type it up in the chat. Grab the mic and, and, and react. Jade, can you elaborate on that? Love it. Eye-opening. Um, I've come from a kindergarten background, too, so I kind of feel like we do do that with the kids. We are always trying to get them out there and doing things. Awesome. Agree, Jamie. Hi, uh, Jeremy. Somehow the, there's a shift from kindergarten even into grade one or two, and well, Jennifer, I know I come across to the kids as being 120 or 12. They weren't quite sure. It reminds me of when I was a kindergarten student, thinking back where I don't feel like we were given that many opportunities to be creative to explore all of those hundred things we were told to do, just this or just this. Absolutely. The first time I saw this clip, I had a bit of professional guilt. I felt guilty <laughs> that, that I'd maybe stolen some learning. And, and the whole fact that we, I've, I've used this before, but school is overly sanitized. Like we clean everything up before we give it to kids and we put it in little compartments. This is the math compartment and this is the science compartment and, you know, the language and the art and heaven forbid if they ever cross, you know, because i got to get my marks for this report card and, and my marks for this and make sure the students know this and this. And I mean, we've got curriculum documents and I know all that, but I felt like I needed to be doing better in terms of, kind of blurring those lines and, and, and working on those hundred skills and hundred, hundred, hundred more um, that kids could have. Um, then I'm, I'm going to kind of shift away from my, oh, see, now I stop because I want to read something in the chat room. Moving and creating, absolutely. Last year when I taught kindergarten, we ran one kilometer before we even started. So I greeted them at the door, and before they even came in and took their clothes, we did three laps of our playground. Um, and that's kind of a formalized moving, and then we never stopped after that. It was wonderful. I miss that so much. So in the kindergarten, I grabbed hold of as much of that Riggio Emilio philosophy of kids moving and making and breaking and fixing and repairing, and, and I grabbed it um, as much as I could. And I would have, before teaching FDK, said that I, I was more of a constructivist educator. So I believed, um, you know, that learning happens um, it's personal, it happens in your head, and it happens when you take a, a new experience and you merge it with your existing schema, something you already know, and then however that new experience and that schema merge together, that's actually your learning. But after having taught kindergarten or the FDK program, I would now call myself more of a constructivist. And, and that's a, co a term coined by Papert, if you've done any of his reading. But what he says is he agrees with the idea of cons uh, constructivism, but all of that happens, he would suggest, more readily when the learner is engaged in a personally meaningful activity outside of her head that makes the learning real and it makes it shareable. So it's after being an FDK that I would have now 
switched from being uh, constructivism to constructionism. And um, it's been an interesting switch for me. Green check mark if you know this book. Red X, I guess, if you don't, but I could do the math and subtract. Okay. For those that don't know this book, I would recommend it. Um, I did a lot of head nodding when I was reading this book. It starts off by going over the history of, um, well, actually, construction constructivism and constructionism, lots of ideas from Piaget and Papert going through, but then it, it just takes us into the tinkering, and I've, I brought some other ideas from this book into the, the presentation later on, but if you're at all interested in this topic in general, I think that this would be a, a great March break read or, or going forward, but it's definitely kind of reaffirmed um, my switch. In, in how I teach, um, and so it's always good to have somebody else kind of encouraging you, even though, I mean, I follow both of them on Twitter, but we don't have many conversations, but I find it encouraging just this book. Another document, this is uh, the link I will give to you, or it's in a document I prepared with all the links, but um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a push now across Canada to revision and revamp our school systems. Um, and as they say, they want to redefine the learning landscape in, in Canada. And actually, there's a new document from winter of 2016, just released a little while ago from the ministry, that's called uh, 21st Century Competencies, the Foundation Document for Discussion. And what these groups and this kind of research um, collection is looking at how we need to change the way we teach um, so that we're actually creating competent adults to deal with the future in which they're going to be living. Um, and I do think that very soon we are going to switch away from subjects. And these are the 21st century competencies. And I, for how many of you is, is this new? It was new to me, but I was just not sure if maybe I hadn't paid attention. These are the competencies, and actually there's a, a renaming happening that they're going to be called the global competencies. Um, these are going to be the focus of what we teach and how we teach. Yep, for sure. Very much like full and six C's. These are the seven C's. Okay. So in, in that document, Shifting Minds, they go into why the rationale between, behind why we need to um, put our energy towards developing these competencies in our students. So again, this is another great read, but I don't think we're going to get a lot of value in talking about them now specifically, but I think you'll see how they have um, kind of underpinned what it is that I've been working on. I know librarians, teacher librarians, this is our document, um, Together for Learning, School Libraries, and it's a vision for the 21st century as well. And there has been a very specific and um, direct call for teacher librarians to shift from libraries to learning commons. Um, and I see the makerspace movement kind of, it must be part of a learning commons in terms of um, how I see the learning commons. And I don't know if the other people working as teacher librarians or other people, any thoughts on, on this? I love the idea that they keep taking us out of the library. Like, I'm technically the librarian, but I'm using it as a classroom. I've got, I'm teaching classes in there. I'm not there to provide any help. Yes, absolutely. I'm not a full-time teacher librarian either. I think I'm 0.5, and it's hard to be a teacher librarian in the Learning Commons for half the day. Well, 
yes, like I'm teaching drama and dance and music in there. I'm not available to do library stuff with them. Right. Cheryl, did you want to say something? Sure. So like the two of you, I'm also um, in the learning commons. And uh, my official time in the learning commons this year is 35%. Uh, it's my first year in the role of teacher librarian. So um, we are just beginning our journey of trying to add in those elements of a maker space. And like you, Mary Kay, I definitely agree that that should be an essential part of that learning commons. But it's just working through the operationals and the logistics of it, how to make it work um, and monitor it and regulate it and without having somebody in there at all times. So absolutely. Starting points, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I've asked my administration if I could do my yard duty in there to see if that can at least get the ball rolling. Right, and so right now what I do is I um, informally keep the library open at recess. It's not my yard duty time, but I figure I'm in there anyway, so I kind of let kids come and cycle through that way. But ideally, I'd like to see it where teachers are embracing it and see it as an extension of what they're doing in the classroom rather than kind of just, um, you know, when, when you're finished your work kind of thing. Absolutely. And that leads into my first step. So I am teacher librarian and classroom teacher. So I passionately wanted to bring in a makerspace movement to our school. So I thought my first step was to bring it into the library learning commons. And so a big part of that space now has been repurposed away from quiet work. And I've, um, I'm getting a wall knocked down. And I've got flexible tables uh, for arranging different configurations and the space is now all about making and sharing. So the first thing I did is it is open all the time, which means that even when I'm teaching, other kids can come in and do makerspace activities. Um, I have done all that I can to increase student access to this learning space. So I am open every morning at 8.30 in the morning. I've got um, some music playing. I use Google Play, the spotless uh, uh, playlist, I guess, so that there's no inappropriate lyrics coming in. I always have a bowl of fruit, apples, um, bananas in the learning commons. I've brought in a water cooler so that kids can get water. And I am open from 8.30, and our classes start at 9 in the morning. So from 8.30 to 9 um, in the morning, every recess I'm open. And then I'm also open after school, um, usually from 3.30 to 5, two nights a week, just because I thought that if I want to have this makerspace movement come to the school, um, I've got to put some time into developing that culture, because I knew it wasn't going to happen overnight. In the first couple days, it was empty, and then stuff started to um, to change. And kids started coming in, and kids started just grabbing things and making things. And some are silly, and some are detailed, and you can see um, the one in the lower, the image in the lower left corner. One of my grade two students was trying to build a dinosaur skeleton. And so that's the dinosaur spine that was being built. The one on top of that, that's a SDK version of a giraffe. Um, the person in the middle was a flat personality from one of my very punny grade sixes. And then the octagonal pyramid -y kind, not pyramid, prism kind of thing, and the chair. Those were some intermediate um, student creations. So the making started. And I didn't instruct. I didn't put up prompts. I just put out the, um, the materials. I've got Lego. I've got Connects. I've got all that kind of childhood play, tinker toys, um, everything else. I saw somebody else ask about, do I have parent volunteers? So far, it's just been me. But I have started now having some other teachers 
coming in and saying, you know, Mary Kay, if you want a break, I'd be happy to supervise this recess and things like that. And as soon as that has started, I'm like, I'm getting the kids, but I'm also getting the staff. And, um, you know, I'm really, really happy about that. Um, in that Invent to Learn book that I shared earlier, they suggest you focus on three aspects, the fabrication, the physical computing, and the programming. So this is what I started with, was just these little um, the blocks in the traditional building. But I also have um, the robotics for the physical computing. So I have bought some little bits and makey makeys and ozobots and dash and dots. And they have just started to take off in, in terms of how kids are using them in the makerspace. And so I don't have images, but if you want to tweet me after, I'd be happy to share links and, and little videos of, of what the kids are doing with that. And then for programming, the kids are always on scratch in the, in the learning commons, um, making video games, making their own kind of whack-a-mole kind of games, and, and car racing games seems to be the big buzz right now. So um, in terms of the positives that I've seen from students, um, in my notes here, I, I wrote down that I have overheard conversations that during instructional time, I work so hard to encourage, and they just seem to happen when I'm walking by kids building with blocks. So I love that kind of natural learning conversation that comes out of kids. They have it. They're competent. Um, it just oozes. And I love the mixed age groups. When a kindergarten student walks over to a grade 8 and asks, hey, what's your building, kind of thing, and, and then the reverse happens a couple days later, I think that's really awesome for our school community, um, that we're all, you know, in it together and we all can learn from each other. I'm trying to share this out as much as I can. So I've got a bulletin board outside the Learning Commons and I'm constantly snapping pictures and the Photos will go up on the bulletin board, and they also run as a little slideshow whenever we get together in the gym. I just run the photo roll through the slideshow so that kids who may be missed coming into the Learning Commons one day could start to see um, what's, what's going on there, and I think I've drummed up a little bit more business. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is, an, is another YouTube video because this... I played in the Learning Commons maybe uh, two weeks ago now, and I'd just like you to watch this video and then react to it again in the chat. So it'll be exactly like, it's a little bit longer. There'll be no professional guilt after watching this. And while you're watching this, I'm going to scroll back through this chat because I'm missing a lot of great comments, I know. Oh, no. Let me try that again. Hold on. Is that? I wonder if I just got the uh, URL wrong. Just give me a second here. I can't believe okay. I removed that video. No, I don't think it's hold done. On, hold on. Let's try again. Uh-oh. Okay, what's going on now? Let me... Give me a second. Sorry about that, folks. No. Oh. I'll go back, Cheryl. I don't limit. The other day I had 120. I haven't reached my fire code number yet, so I do walk mm -hmm. around and count. Oh, um, Alan, the stories the kids tell me are awesome when they're building. Okay, I just found a different URL. I'm not sure why that URL wasn't the right one, but let's try it again. Sorry about that. I just did a quick search. Thank you, Colin. Oh, no problem. That's what we're here for. Let's That's try what this. Hey there, how's that? Is that it? Awesome. Should be it, yep. Okay, I'll put the link in the chat too. And give us a green check mark when you're done, folks, as well, just same as last time.
So it looks like people are finishing. Just give us a quick green check mark. In fact, it's finished for you, please. And then I'll, I'll shift back to the slide. I think everybody's almost done. Or maybe done and, and didn't mm -hmm. click the, the green check mark. I think we're probably good to keep going. Okay, awesome. So, after I showed that video, we started going through the, their, their uh, YouTube channel. And the kids, so I just would put that up um, on the screen during recess or at uh, 8.30. And then the kids started noticing all the little comments about all the redesigns and the testing. And that has been the next improvement in our makerspace. Because while kids were happily, happily building, there wasn't that, um, that bricolage effect where they would do something and then stand back and look at it and then try to make it better. Um, and now after they see that people actually do edit their work and revise and revise and all the patience that it takes. Um, that's been a game changer again in our in the learning commons and the makerspace because now there's more of an element of quality and about revisiting their constructions, which is actually now the biggest pain in my neck because before they would build and then clean up and it was great and now they're building and wanting to, to leave it up and um, I'm running out of materials and the floor is looks like construction tape everywhere and pylons and you know you have to walk very carefully. Um, but it's great because I agree it's an awesome problem to have. Um, because I think that this is a big part of makerspace. This is maybe what takes it away from a craft fair um, towards a makerspace, that whole element of revising and improving and, and tinkering, that, that whole aspect. Anybody want to grab the mic and make a comment? And Somebody asked earlier in the chat um, how, I, how I manage the behavior of students um, in mm -hmm. the learning commons. There has not been an issue. And I say that, and I, I understand it, it's almost like the ministry videos, you know, where they have 10 kids and everybody sits and answers all the questions perfectly, and you think, what <laughs> is that going on? But really, I haven't had to ask a kid to leave or to change their behavior. Um, I've got yeah. music on, I've got food on, and I'm kind of letting them do their own thing. And it goes back to that, that philosophy from Reggio Amelia. If you view the child as capable, they are. <laughs> and they want to be there mm -hmm. because it's always optional for them to be inside. If they don't feel like being there um, in the learning commons, they can be outside at recess and, or in another yeah. space in the school. Yeah, Mary Kay, I just want to share one quick thing. Uh, yeah. I don't have a make, I don't have a makerspace, but just this past week, I've sort of, I had some 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 boxes of of um, stuff that came from uh, a company called TeacherGeek.com. It's kind of like a like a connects kind of building thing. It's it's a different style, but you know, kids are you can basically make a whole lot of machines with it. And I have a one L two L science uh, class that's locally developed, grade nine and grade ten science. And I've got this one kid who's like the bane of my existence. We started doing this this week. And he was just a different kid, right? When I wasn't telling him or trying to get him to do what I wanted to do, and I just said, go build something. He was a completely different kid. He actually showed up on time before the bell for the first time ever all semester. I almost fell over when he walked through the door the second day we were doing this. So you're absolutely right about if you let them sort of explore a little bit, the behavior stuff kind of goes away a little bit. Not completely. I'm not going to say it goes completely, but this was a different kid than what I saw, for example, last week. So I'm, I'm becoming a proponent of this kind of thing as well. Yeah, without a doubt. Anybody else want to grab the mic? Or is there a question that you've typed in chat that I missed that you would like to be answered at this point? Because I don't want to get to the end and then have like 40 questions that people have asked me. For the after school stuff, I do have a permission form, so I know and I hold kids till five till I see a parent come pick them up. Um, oh yeah, the deconstruction zone, bringing in the weed whacker. 
I, I brought in an old steam iron and the kids were taking it apart and anything old in computer that the school has that is just dead and no longer good for anything has been taken apart. Awesome, Shalon. And the thing too in the makerspace is in the take aparts, I have real tools. I don't have kitty screwdrivers, I have screwdrivers and I have, you know, little pry bars and, and things like that. Um, so it's the real, real stuff. And I have glass. I know, crazy. The wild world in my learning commons, glass and tools. Ah, I did not have a budget. Um, I did buy some things out of my own pocket, but I also have two um, children of my own that are in university now. So the Lego is from my house, the Connects is from my house. I've asked other teachers and parents if they don't mind bringing it in to bring it in. Um, and so far, so good. Um, but those Kiva planks that a lot of those little things were created with, I went out and bought um, myself because they're mine and my nieces and everybody else will, will love playing with them at the cottage. Well, Elizabeth, I'm glad you asked because that's kind of where I'm going um, with the rest of this, this presentation because this is all great in the learning commons. Um, from 8.30 to 9 and from 11 to 11.30 and kind of at both recesses and after school. But, um, you know, that's only part of the school time and I truly believe this is how kids learn best. This is how kids start to feel good about themselves as learners. This is how we build a community between the school and the community and within the school. And so, I want more of our day to be makerspace um, related. And yeah, Jennifer, I'm, I'm donating this much time. I, as I said, my kids are older, they're gone. Um, I've got this time right now to kind of hang out with kids and it's what I love to do. So, so that's what I'm doing, but absolutely my choice. Not, not anything that I've been asked to do by my administrator, but she would definitely be sad, I think, if I, if I stopped doing it. Uh, sorry, the last little part about the, the learning commons is I have a make and take section and it's not always open, but um, I've taught myself to knit on YouTube and to paint with acrylics and to do these black and white drawings called Zentangles. And so I brought those and my supplies and my interest in that in and we've had kids knitting these dishcloths and the make and takes are obviously they make it at school and with the supplies there and then they get to take it home. And the upper right corner there is the duct tape wallet and that was, I think I bought out all of the duct tape in this Wellington County area. And yes, I did get a budget for that. Um, it's, it's not out of my own pocket. But um, we definitely have a make and take section that uh, is very, very popular. So. I wanted to ooze my, my learning commons maker space out of recess time and into an instructional time. So I devised this Google Doc, uh, Google Form that, um, and this was through conversation with the staff and with um, the administrators. Students can now apply to get out of the regular class time to come and complete an independent learning project in the learning commons and I would supervise them and, and help them. So Colin might be putting the link up to this Google Doc, I knew he would, um, but this is how I have tried to ooze my learning commons time into the instructional time because as I said before, I believe this is how kids learn. So, you know, it gives chance, kids a chance to take control of their, their own learning. Um, simple questions, would I revise it next year? Absolutely, but I do think that this is, um, you know, it's not really about the form, it's about the intention behind the form and um, so far so good with, with that. It absolutely is like a passion project, Cheryl, and, and the kids can come in. Um, 
they come in and do a movie with the green screen app, um, do ink, or they'll come in and work on claymation, or they'll come and build. Um, I have access actually to the old industrial arts lab and the science teacher who is trained on all the tools um, works with me now to get kids working on, you know, somebody's making a little table for their mom for Mother's Day um, instead of going to history and something else. And then it's my responsibility to make sure that the history, there's some kind of assessment, but we're doing it kind of alternatively to what the other kids are doing so that he has this school time to work on this project. Yeah, it, it's pretty awesome. Sorry about that coughing fit. Um, how well is it being received and utilized? Uh, it is just starting to be used. Um, you know, we had that different, different in air quotes, start to the school year. So really it's only been going um, since January. And what has happened the way our school works is the instrumental music program has to kind of happen on a rotation basis. So I grabbed part of the rotation to help make those music classes a bit smaller. And some of my library time, I grabbed some intermediates. And I've been working um, with them on, on Tinkercad and doing some 3D printing. And that has definitely um, grabbed some kids to um, take advantage of this independent learning opportunity. And so it's just really starting to pick up. And so, you know, really for, for the first year, I'm, I'm pleased with the take up on it. And I'm, you know, optimistic that next year um, it's going to be a lot busier. Okay. Have, have yeah. all the teachers bought into the idea and sort of are looking for ways to sort of integrate curricular things with this opportunity for kids to you know, to find those connections for kids and then send them to, to do something that's maybe related to, I don't know, science or arts or whatever they're interested in? Are they starting to find those connections? Uh, the French teacher is grabbing mm -hmm. hold of it because of all the um, communication tech that I can do with them since the French is now so such an oral program. Mm -hmm. But she's got some shy kids. So, so that's been her motivation and that's been a great partnership. The rest is slow. <laughs> mm -hmm. snail space, but I think um, for the teachers that are maybe more reluctant or leery about the learning, um, the kids aren't going to let them hold back for too much longer. Yeah, right. So, and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, kid, the kids' voice is starting to get pretty loud in our school, cool. which is exciting. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, be their school. Yeah, that is exciting. Um, any any other comments, questions? I see your comment, James, and I, I am going to get there because I'm bringing it into my math class because that's the only classroom I have control of right now. But I'm hoping, um, and I am doing PD at staff meetings, and I am inviting, and at every staff meeting there's a maker component to it um, where I'm showing them and, and teachers are doing. and. You know, I always point out, as excited as you are right now, this is how kids feel too. So, um, love this quote. It's going to be so important going forward. It's kind of that shift from, you know, the industrial age where we just had to know our facts and, you know, have them in our back pocket to the knowledge age where the knowledge is everywhere. It's, it's what we do with it. And we've got to be able to learn and unlearn and relearn and, and tinker with ideas. And so this is the definition of makerspace. And I know it maybe seems funny to, to share it here. But you know, I'm, I was happy with the learning commons time. And I was happy with how, and I am happy with how students are starting to leave their classes to join the the library learning commons and continue the makerspace. But then I was kind of thinking that perhaps makerspace isn't actually a physical location, as this definition would say, but it's more of a state of mind. And when I go back to those 21st century competencies that as a classroom teacher, I'm supposed to start thinking about you know, intentionally addressing, um, could I bring the positive aspects of what I'm seeing in the learning commons 
could I bring those into my math classroom? And could I have that kind of maker space mentality or maker mentality in the math class? And so, so what I did was I said, yeah, sure, but I'm going to stick pretty close to that whole construction. So I teach the grade six math and, and I had students construct marble runs. And, and what I was thinking about when I had made kind of this activity was that it would be multi-stranded. So they were going to be measuring and it was going to be our work on angles, the acute of two straight and right angle. And it was also going to be data management because they were going to um, put the marble through a hundred times and do all the measures of central tendency. So the mean, median, and mode. And we were going to look at collecting the data in a spreadsheet and, and kind of that aspect. So the data collection and then the data analysis was going to happen. So I thought, okay, that, that's pretty good. So because makerspace is supposed to be cross subject, but I couldn't, I didn't do that first, but at least I went cross stranded and there was the whole measuring component and, and teamwork component and it was awesome. It was absolutely awesome in class and the kids were just buzzing and kind of, you know, really there was almost like a beehive energy in, in the classroom and that was, you know, not too long ago and the engagement was awesome and I started to get messages, texts from parents and things like, what happened in class? Because they're just talking all about math at the dinner table and asking, you know, well, would I want the mean or the median or the mode? And, and these were dinner table conversations. So the energy from the makerspace was coming through on this project. But it's not all, you know, rainbows and, and puppy dogs. There are some problems because, um, you know, kids are used to this kind of assembly line approach to classrooms. And even though these kids aren't very old, um, they are used to this mentality of I just sit and I do and we all create the same thing, um, like an assembly line. And they play this game of what does the teacher want me to do right now. And so I started to, to recognize that coming through um, in this Marble Run project and I never ever saw anything like that um, at recess time. And I also ran into problems because I, I played the, the plan first card. Um, you know, I, I wanted them to blueprint their design first before they started to build. And, um, you know, they couldn't get their supplies until I'd seen a blueprint. And, and then I started rereading that um, Steger and Libo Martinez book and I thought, they even warned me, don't over plan, don't over emphasize the planning because makers don't always plan it out first. Some of the greatest learning, right, is when you make a mistake and learning's not linear. And so, um, you know, you take two steps forward and then you're thinking you're making your third improvement when really it's a regression and so it's not forward. And I tried to make this project so linear for the kids, but I would never do that at recess. And I don't think I'll ever do that again during the classroom time. Any comments? Oh, I, I hear the ding. I can't scroll down. So whoever it was, was it Ellen? Ellen, grab the mic. Yeah, hi. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. I can. Did you want to make a comment or a question? Yeah, I was just going to talk about the space and the progression that I've been through. Um, I've been using bins. So every single, you know, group of materials I put in a bin so the kids kind of, I don't have the physical space to have an actual maker space, but I've been trying to set things up um, in bins and gradually. So the grade one teacher told me she want, she was working on magnets. So I've just started a bin with magnets and the kids come and, you know, take out the bin and, and play around with it. But the other thing that I've done is, is used all our old digital cameras. Um, in terms of recording, you know, for what kids to, to show the teachers and to have evidence of what they've done, we've used the old digital cameras. Awesome. Awesome. Because sharing is so much a, a big part of it. And I learned that last year when I was in the FDK program, that whole thing of documentation. And I got 
pretty good last yeah. year of, of not making tasks for kids to complete, but rather putting my energy towards watching for evidence of their learning and, and then documenting it. So that whole camera thing, capture a picture, is, is really important, I think. I, I like the thing about bins. The thing I worry about, and this is probably from my math teaching days and math consultant days, is when we only open some bins, and I guess I totally understand that it's a practical thing, we maybe shut off something else for a kid. So I don't know. I'm, I'm messing around with that, how open I can keep everything, as open as I possibly can, I think is the way I want to be, so that kids can make those choices. Yeah, when I say bins, I just mean that kids can come and help themselves to whatever materials they need. Um, and it's sort of, it's more like, so it's self-serve. They take what they need, but they put it back just because I don't have the space to keep it set up all the time. Awesome. And so going back to the um, the whole notion here about the kids and their uncomfortable nature of, you know, what the teacher wants and what is expected. I go back to my teacher librarian roots and kind of support them by building this culture of a maker space, even in my math class and in my language class, by suggesting these picture books and others. And there'll be a link that comes up, but if you click on that link, it's going to take you to an empty document, unfortunately. But if you save the link, I will have uh, an annotated bibliography of picture books that really support this whole makerspace mindset, the whole tinkering and, and you know, architect and design. And the OK book that you see there is a new book to me, and it's about just being OK at everything until you find your really uh, strong gift. And I, I really like that book. So just, I find picture books help to get kids, um, give kids permission to step out of their comfort zone and, and really, because we can't shift on them halfway through and expect them to just kind of go from a, a very traditional classroom to a maker space kind of uh, classroom without feeling any kind of anxiety. The other thing I noticed in the classroom that I wasn't noticing um, is that when we do a lot of partner work, some kids are left out. And I really have to, um, be cognizant of, of the kid that's invisible in the class. And I read this picture book to my grade six class about the invisible boy and what it is. It's a very shy boy who's quiet off to the side and he's never picked. He's picked last on every team and he's never picked for partnerships until another boy comes to school and they start to realize all the gifts that this invisible boy has and it kind of changes um, how he is viewed by his peers. And so even after reading this a couple, uh, one time, I've and I've had a couple more opportunities, I've seen the um, the kids who I would have maybe called invisible after, you know, connecting it to this book, they've been included more by their peers. But I think when we do group work, it's really important for us to be careful about um, which child is always last pick or which child has to go and ask you know, couple groups to join and, and tribes programs and all those kinds of things are important to make sure that it's not, I've called it before, teacher sanctioned bullying when the kids always make their groups and the kid, the last kid is always the one that's left out. It, it breaks my heart. Another thing that I thought I could bring in was from the makerspace and uh, Gary Steger talks about this is the lumped less us and more them. Um, he talks about TMI and it's too much instruction, too much interruption, and too much intervention all on the part of the teacher. So he says that TMI should be think, make, and improve. And so things that I have brought into to my math class now is for example, uh, we were doing our data management surveys and graphing, and I wanted the kids to make an infographic um, that summarized some data that they had collected and analyzed. And so I made a survey 
and I had the kids complete that survey, and then I quickly showed them how I could, could make a graph of their data, because it would populate the spreadsheet. And then I told them, and I would like them to use this data on an infographic and create an infographic digitally. And I suggested a program called PictoChart, but if they wanted to find another piece of software or, or web program that would create it, that was absolutely fine. And then I stopped talking. And then the kids had to go and figure stuff out. And so I didn't actually teach. I just told them my expectations, and then I got out of their way. And there was a little bit of a panic, and then somebody started Googling, and somebody else made a little bit of progress, and very quickly, um, they were starting to teach each other, and the project started happening, and it really only took about uh, two minutes of instruction on my part. And so actually, Steger says that's the goal, two minutes of instruction and then be quiet and let the kids kind of take it where it is. And then obviously, you're going to coach and intervene if there's, it's necessary, um, but we don't need to talk as much as maybe we have traditionally. I also started doing an I can help chart. And I have it in my math class now, but it's also in the learning commons. And basically, if you have a skill or you have just learned something and you feel that you're competent at it enough to help somebody else, you go and describe that skill and you write your name on it. So it's very busy right now with our Tinkercad because um, the kids want to print 3D everything, but you know they're running into issues um, designing in all three planes has, has been a bit of a problem for some kids. So if as soon as somebody has a skill, they put it up, write their name, and then kids don't come to me, they come to the other kid, um, both in class and in the learning commons at recess. And that is lovely to watch the kids um, teach each other. That's kind of, you know, where it's all at. Any strategies that you've tried? to talk less and to empower the kids more? I need to just maybe be quiet and wait. Hi, I started a crochet club. Awesome. And yeah, it actually, it's been quite delightful. I basically taught them how to make a chain and to do single crochet, and they've taken off, and now, honestly, I just provide the time. They're teaching themselves. It's awesome to watch. It is. It's, it's beautiful. So I kind of feel like I've sort of started a maker space, but it's without only a doubt. one. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt, that's a maker space. And they'll make their own stitches and name them after you. <laughs> They're it's very cute. At first, one of the girls was going to make and sell hats, but she was only going to charge five dollars, <laughs> forgetting that wool costs more than that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's another lesson for them to learn, right? The math lesson, yeah. Oh, I love that, Caitlin. Most definitely, Kim. Absolutely, Leslie, show them that we are learning right along with them. And that's, I brought in my sketchbook because on the wall, kind of behind my desk, I have my good drawings, but then I brought in my other drawings that I won't frame. But the kids, it was kind of important for the kids to see that I mess up as, as often as I succeed, way more probably. I think sometimes we present ourselves as, you know, finished products and we already know what we're doing all the time and it's good for kids to see that we're still learning even at, you know, I'm ancient to them, so at my ancient age I'm I'm still learning new things and, and that's good. Absolutely. Questions are hard. But I used to worry and not ask until I thought I had the right question, especially when it was all that inquiry focus and I was really realizing that the question is so important. 
and then I realized probably asking any question is better than just being silent, and my questioning would get better. But definitely less us, more them. Anybody think they talk not enough in class? Yeah. Crickets. We have a lot of kids in our class that um, aren't used to this struggle. And it tends to be, from my experience, the kids that have traditionally done very well in school um, are very uncomfortable by um, either teaching through problem solving or this maker's, uh, maker space mindset. Um, and, and it's really hard to you know, to tell them that it won't always be that way. <laughs> that, you know, life is about figuring out struggles and getting over them and as soon as you get one done, the next one's going to come. And, you know, lots of us lead lives that the struggles are really minor and some of us lead lives that the struggles are quite significant and it always requires us to learn and to deal with, like, self-regulation and perseverance and that whole resiliency piece. Um, and it goes back to what I think too before that teachers tend to sanitize school and learning and then a lot of our students do well because they're compliant. We ask them to do something and they go ahead and do it and then we ask them to do something else and they do that as well and then they get rewarded with good marks and that's not always learning. Um, it might be achieving and I've on other webinars talked about the difference between my understanding about achieving versus learning and they're not always the same. So I've had to spend, because this whole makerspace approach in my classroom when they're going to be getting marks um, has caused some anxiety for some kids so I do spend instructional time on dealing with frustration and you know how to deal with it appropriately because they can all deal with it but it's good to learn how to deal with it appropriately and how to get unstuck um, when they are stuck. Um, pretty big thing to do because if you always wait for somebody to teach you how to get out of the problem, when there are no more teachers in your life, formal teachers, then where's your progress? You're, you're sitting there. So along this lines, I brought this work from Carol Dweck. Anybody familiar with Carol Dweck's work about mindset? See some checks coming up? Awesome. So this whole growth mindset piece, um, it was daunting at first, but then I, I listened to a webinar or maybe it was just a little video from Dweck and she said, the really cool thing about this is even when you tell kids that there are these two mindsets, that helps move kids towards a growth mindset. You don't even have to coach them on you know, the aspects of it and what they can do, just telling them that there are two ways of looking at the world and their own, you know, learning within that world helps them move towards the growth mindset. That was a, a relief for me. I got two kids and one of my sons has a fixed mindset and one has a growth mindset. And, you know, it's been really hard to watch the one with a fixed mindset make some choices going forward into his adult life and we keep working towards this uh, more growth mindset because a fixed mindset is so paralyzing and will only become more paralyzing, I think, um, as time goes forward. Comments about this? This is a big one for tinkering if it's going to be in your classroom and you're going to be giving marks because um, you do have to assess uh, if it's happening in your classroom. I think I ramble right over all your questions, and I, I will apologize about that. The other aspect I can bring into my classroom from Makerspace is pretty obvious, but creation over consumption. So I ask my math students a lot to make eye movies or somehow archive. Um, they're thinking about 
you know, uh, one, the most recent one was creating a regular and an irregular polygon. Um, what do they have to consider? As opposed to just giving them definitions and worksheets in which they, you know, measure angles on a regular polygon and things like that. So much more broad tasks that I assign, but it gives kids a chance to take it their own way and, and make a creation that shows me the learning. And my job then is not to to spend time making the worksheet that when they fill in, I know they've hit the expectations, but it's to really know my curriculum well so that when they do create something, I can recognize the learning that they're showing me um, as it relates to those expectations. Comments? So, uh, the top is STEM and the bottom is STEAM. And if you type these into any search engine, you will get oodles of tasks that you could easily bring into your programs um, to kind of start building that makerspace uh, mindset in your classroom. So the STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. And then STEAM adds the whole component of art in it as well. And so they are cross-curricular tasks or challenges that, um, as I said, you can find them all over the internet. But like everything that's all over the internet, beware of the avalanche of garbage because some will obviously be better than others. And um, I wasn't going to say which one I thought was good. I, I was in curriculum department in our board for a while. so. I tend to match things up pretty closely with curriculum expectations, and you maybe don't have to do it as closely as I do, but I would caution you that when you go and find a great source, be it maybe Pinterest, that is tends to be a great, uh, not great necessarily, but a common source of activities that happen in the classroom, make sure that there's learning in it. There needs to be that cognitive struggle, and it should be related to the curriculum because if the kid's going to struggle about it, it, it should be kind of on topic, at least loosely. What are the better STEAM resources? Sorry, Jeremy, I was hoping somebody could tell me. I, I think you just have to look and kind of have an idea of what your kids need at that moment. Lots of Da Vinci stuff is all STEAM. Anybody else used any resources for this STEM and STEAM? Any good website? Any good resource bank? So I'll take that then as my challenge to go and find some, and I'll be happy to tweet them out. Or if you get in touch with me, um, I'll be happy to share what I find. And so, OKW Maker Club on Facebook. Awesome. I mean, I, I think the art could be integrated into almost anything in terms of how they share their learning. So if there's a media component um, that they don't just make, make, you know, the one artifact, but they actually archive that or, you know, turn it into a media project or share it. Um, that kind of art, sculpture, color choice, I mean, there's all kinds of art, depending, this is the problem, I guess, how, how much do the teachers want to put on top of the maker space by, you know, I guess that's the struggle that I've got right now is, in the classroom, how much student-directed learning, how open can I let that be and still get what I need as the teacher? I don't know. See, I'm really just struggling um, with this whole thing. It's it's very new to me, so my thoughts aren't yet uh, consolidated. Oh, science camp. Awesome. Colin, you're in the science world. What do you think? Do you, do you have a bank? Steam? It, it, you know, it's funny because I was sitting here thinking if, if I could, you know, pull out that one great sort of resource. And, it's like you said, it sort of depends what you want. Like I use different things all the time. 
you know, I'll use, uh, um, I don't know, things like, I uh, think like, like things like explore learning gizmos and things like that as, as a science-based thing. Um, sometimes, but then other times I go, you know, it's not the right fit for, for the kind of the group that I've got. And um, I, I often just sort of let kids kind of tell me what they want to do. You know what I mean? Like I know what the curriculum is and, and we sort of hash out ways of them demonstrating things. Like, I don't know, I tweeted out a picture this afternoon. Uh, this is just a random example. Uh, in my, my astronomy class, the kids were learning about things like the phases of the moon. And one of the kids said, you know, I have it on a piece of paper. Can I, can I draw it on the board? And he started, and I gave him a little bit of feedback that, that he could change it a little bit. So he ended up with this really cool piece of artwork that ended up on, on my chalkboard that was explaining the curriculum stuff that we had just done. And in, in my mind, that was you know a, a complete STEAM type approach, but I didn't plan that. <laughs> he was just demonstrating what he knew, yeah. but he knew that, that he could do it in a way that suited him. And so if you go look at my Twitter stream, you'll see that, that uh, picture that I posted this afternoon, and it was just really cool. So that, that, I don't know. I think I have a maybe a mindset around that rather than a place I go and get stuff specifically. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's maybe what we need to do mm -hmm. is not necessarily bring in the steam, but recognize it when a child mm -hmm. does or a student does and, and, and open ourselves to however they want us to show us their learning. We're cool with that. We're open to it. Luis, I see your dilemma. Um, just reading. Well, every curriculum has got that overall expectation that has to do with explore, create, plan. So I think there's probably very little that you couldn't make at least a loose tie in to the curriculum. Absolutely, it's all inquiry. So anything um, probably goes back to the the overall expectation and the specific expectation. Learning skills, as Colin says, absolutely. And sometimes it's just about having motivated learners. <laughs> you know, maybe we can't be so picky about what they're learning about and just kind of riding that, that energy without, <laughs> you know, waking up and realizing it's May. Well, yeah, um, I think one of the things that, that I sort of realized is, is, and this, not a lot of teachers agree with me on this for, in my conversation, so whatever. I've learned to let go of so much of the stuff that I thought was important in, in exchange for helping kids kind of build skills. Like the curriculum, in my mind, the curriculum is no longer, you know, a checklist of things that I, I need to get covered. It's sort of a guide to help me focus on skills. And if I don't get some of the stuff covered, but the kids are learning about how they learn and becoming better learners, in my mind, that's okay. Um, yeah, I know some people, you know, sort of have, and I, I will admit, I struggle with that a little bit because in the back of my mind, I'm going, yeah, but we got EQAO, and yeah, but yeah, but we got other teachers teaching the same class, and then the parents will complain that they're doing different things in in that class versus in your class, and 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 I get all that. Um, I just the the benefits I've seen in sort of letting go of my curricular mentality, if I can use yeah. that as a, as an expression, um, as more always, like you said, just get them learning. And that will take them farther than, you know, trying to memorize some list. I'm a science teacher, so memorizing some, you know, list of facts or about the periodic table or whatever, right? It's more about the skills of learning and how science works as a process that I focus on now. Absolutely. Yeah, like the Magna Carta is in grade four social studies, and I'm embarrassed to say, but it's only recently that I understood what exactly it was. <laughs> and I think only recently that I actually heard the actual term for it or the name of it. And I thought, well, I've been quite a successful adult without knowing this. There you go. So, so a lot of these things maybe we have to, you know, look at with 21st century eyes when we read the curriculum. And, and we have to do some professional, you know, prioritizing what's really important to these kids going forward as learners and and as adults, and if they've learned how to learn and they need to know about the Magna Carta, they'll do that on their own. 
kind of thing. If I've given them the tools to learn and learn about how they learn themselves, that whole mm -hmm. metacognition piece. Absolutely. So this is time for your questions. <laughs> How many minutes until I get a lime drink with mint on a beach? That's my question. Let it go. Somebody should write a song about that. <laughs> yeah, there we go, Colin. <laughs> any questions, any comments, any concerns? Type them, grab the mic. I've done enough rambling and sharing of my, as I said, sorry, my thoughts really aren't consolidated on this, so I was struggling a bit to keep this going in a forward motion. The book list we were developing. Well, I did leave it open. I am absolutely going to populate it, Jennifer, with some picture books and annotate it, but I did make it so that you could edit. So if somebody has a book that you want to put down, um, Absolutely, feel free to to populate it. You'll always have the link, and you know we'll all benefit from it if uh, if you add to that list. So you have the link. Um, I don't think I'll get it done tomorrow, which means I'll probably get it done a week Sunday when I'm back from the break. But um, most certainly, it will be there. Difficult choices as. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to take a, another little bit of time here to figure out how I feel about the whole assessment piece, but I will say that I have heard from a little bird that the report card is going to be changing and it will focus less on the subjects and more on those seven Cs. Um, they might be calling them global competencies, but I believe that is going to be a shift because of the need to shift what happens in classrooms. Um, they're realizing that those shifts won't happen quickly enough unless the report card changes because that is often what drives teachers' actions in the classroom. So not a promise, don't really know much more than that, but I've heard rumors that there will be some changes on the report card link. That's quite a little bomb to drop in the last 10 minutes. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, no idea when, no idea when. And, yeah. um, but, you know, I've heard it from a couple places that, um, I have no, elementary is what I heard, but mm -hmm. usually they're, well, I don't know what universities want, right? Yeah, you know, if if you look at sort of the way the winds are blowing in the province, and I, I mentioned earlier in the chat, like Fullen six C's, and Fullen still has a big, a big you know push in policy and education in Ontario, and you know, he and people like him are saying it's more important to focus on skills and and learning skills and thinking skills rather than straight content skills, and so the word has come back to them like, well, we don't. We don't have time to do that and, you know, teach my five strands of math and do some, you know, my four strands of language and report on it all. And so that, that uh, that's not the first time I've heard people sort of hint, uh, Mary Kay, that there's mm -hmm. some changes in the offing around, around what kind of, what is important and what we're going to be asked to show as being important, if I can say it that way. So it's yeah. interesting. That, that's now two independent sources I've heard sort of hint the same thing. So you yeah. guys are onto something. I I'm love hopeful. them so well, and it's great. Let's keep the rumors going. Even if it's not true, let's make it happen by, yeah. <laughs> by well, starting the I rumors. Heard, I heard <laughs> I heard it was going to happen. So, yeah. so therefore, yeah. I'm not doing my report card the way you want me to. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, hey, <laughs> you heard Colin say that, not me. Um, <laughs> But, you know, like I was talking to people at the Perimeter Institute, which is kind of that think tank in Waterloo, mm -hmm. and they're like, we're, we're tired of getting graduates that can fill in the blanks. Yeah. We already know what is inside the box. Um, we need kids that think outside the box. Mm -hmm. You know, that's who's going to cure cancer. The really annoying child who always asks why and is never on task and never doing what you think they should be doing that's going to be the kid that cures cancer. That's going to be the kid that, you know, finds some revolutionary, you know, new discoveries. Mm. And 
we got to start shifting our school system to support them rather than penalize and, and punish that kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Laura, sorry. Uh, uh, call him secondary teacher. He can start that rumor. I just did it for elementary. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll start it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I was gonna, and I mentioned Fulton. I'm, I'm involved in a project um, which is, is based on Fulton's work. It's called the New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. Uh, you know, NPDL is the acronym. But it's exactly that. Like we are, we are, part of the project is we use the six C's, we pick marker students, but instead of picking marker students, for example, to show how they moved in a strand of math, which is something, you know, we've been doing forever, or in, in reading levels, I'm picking creativity and using assessment tools around creativity and showing how giving kids opportunities to be creative can help them become more creative by assessing their changes in creativity. So that's a small pilot that's happening in a number of school boards and, and I, you know, I'm part of it so I know what's happening. That's not a rumor. And so if they're seeing good things come out of that, then maybe that will start to grow a little bit larger and, and, and other things like that will come out of it. Yeah, and I'm thinking I'm putting in a TLLP next year and hoping it gets, mm -hmm. you know, selected. But again, exploring these seven C's and, and an assessment mm -hmm. and where we might go from, you know, along those lines in terms of what it is, what evidence we're going to be looking for or should we actually assess them. Yeah, yeah. TLLP, if, if you don't know what a TLLP is, you should Google that and start applying because it is awesome PD. If you've been a teacher for five years or more, I think it is, maybe three. It's kind of the opposite of end tip, but I don't know what my topic is. I haven't. It's going to be along the seven C's and assessments and maybe a tool or maybe a, I don't even know. Awesome. I did one like years ago about um, an ugly wiki, which was upper grand librarians made a wiki. Hmm. So that's my first one. And that's how old it was because wiki was new learning. And now they're all in graveyards, digital graveyards. The digital graveyard wiki. I got a few yep. of those too. Yep. So that's that's me. Yeah, I think if we're you want to wrap continue up here, the conversation, okay? if you have a twist. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, if you want to put your Twitter handle in the chat, I'll grab it. If you want to just follow me, I'll follow you back, and we can we can continue these conversations. And that is an email that if you send me a question at that email, I will reply and get back to you. If you're any of the resources that I talked about, um, you can't find in the links or, um, you know, you just have a question about them, get in touch either of those ways and I'd be happy to continue this conversation. And start new ones too. Not rumors mm. though. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, those are fun too. Yeah, that's true. Wonderful. All right. Thanks very, very much. This was a great session, Ricky. I, I really enjoyed it, and I know everybody else did as well. Um, I don't have the links there, but one of the things that we always ask, oops, that's the wrong link. That's, I already put that up there as well, is the, uh, i got to find it for you while I'm uh, talking and, and, and thanking you, is the, uh, the feedback form. I'm going to put the link in the um, chat here, but the way the feedback forms work, as soon as you log out of OTF Connect, you will also get this as a pop-up. A uh, browser should open up. We really need the feedback to help us plan for future sessions. The feedback will also go back to Mary Kay, so you can you know tell her how awesome you thought she was, um, and, and it sort of supports her for going forward. Or if you want to you know make some suggestions, you can do that um, as well. And the, there's a couple of things just to point out to you. There's all kinds of other sessions coming up. And I don't have it here, but I looked up forward. And the end of April, there's a cool session um, from a couple of teacher librarians uh, around the, uh, um, you know, learning for all and, and, the, and the learning commons and, and, you know, growth of libraries and that kind of thing. Um, Deb Kitchener and, uh, oh, the name escapes me. It's on the OTF calendar, which we'll put up there as well. So there's lots of stuff coming up. So uh, keep looking at the OTF calendar because they're always adding new things. And um, it's just always awesome stuff like this one. Uh, you know, there's stuff happening every day of the week pretty much that, that uh, you can join in. One other thing just before we go, and uh, I ask you to, to do that feedback thing again. Um, uh, OTF now has some subsidies for teachers, so if you are interested in taking an AQ or an ABQ, um, 
especially around things like math and tech. So we, you know, we were talking about uh, STEM and STEAM. Uh, there's some money available um, through OTF to help off, help offset some of those costs of taking courses. So you can check out that on the OTF website um, as well. And I think um, that's all. Like I said, if you can click on the form or when you log out of the Blackboard session here, and all you have to do is just click, uh, you know, click the X or click File Exit, or if you're on a Mac, click the red button to close your window, and it'll all zip away on you. I think I've covered off everything I need to cover. I will thank Mary Kay one more time, and thank all of you for attending and participating. It was a lively session with lots of really cool stuff shared. So thanks, everybody, and have a great March break, whether you've got kids tomorrow or not. I know we're all looking forward to uh, having a week off. So thanks again, and, uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.